everyone, and welcome to the regular press conference on COVID-19 here from à cette WHO conférence de presse sur la COVID-19 au siège ici à Genève. As we have announced uh, in our media advisory, we have some special guests that Dr. Tedros will introduce in a minute. I will just introduce our speakers here. Uh, beside Dr. Tedros, with us today are Dr. Mike Ryan, Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove, Mr. Derek Holton, who is a legal counsel, uh, and uh, Dr. Mike Mariangela Simao, uh, Assistant Director General, Simao Access to Medicines and Health Products. Uh, uh, I will give a floor to Dr. Tedros, question and answer session. Puis, nous Thank you. La Thank you, Tedros. you Tariq. Dr. Tedros. Merci, Tariq. Good morning, good afternoon, and Bonjour, bon good evening. Et bonsoir. Today, I'm really honored to be joined by President Carlos Alvarado Quesada of Costa Rica Quesada du and President Costa Rica et le Sebastian Piñera of Sebastian Chile for Chile. today's press conference Nous font or de leur press briefing. Pour, uh, Researchers cette conférence are de presse. working at breakneck speed both to understand the virus and also to develop potential vaccines, medicines, and other technologies. The access to COVID-19 accelerator is uniting efforts on many fronts to ensure we have safe, effective, and affordable therapeutics and vaccines in the shortest time possible. These tools provide additional hope of overcoming COVID-19, but they will not end the pandemic la COVID if we cannot ça ne permettra pas de mettre un terme à la pandémie si nous ne parvenons pas à assurer un accès équitable. Compte tenu de ces circonstances extraordinaires, nous devons euh, faire en sorte que la science utilise tout son pouvoir pour trouver des médicaments qui euh, puissent être abordables et qui puissent bénéficier à tous et partout. Les modèles de marché traditionnels ne euh, nous permettront pas euh, de fournir des résultats à l'échelle dont nous avons besoin pour couvrir l'ensemble de la planète. La solidarité entre les pays et le secteur privé sont essentielles, si tant est que nous voulions surmonter cette période difficile. Il est grand temps que les leaders se mettent ensemble pour mettre au point une nouvelle politique d'accès au niveau mondial et un outil opérationnel qui permettra de faire en sorte que les bonnes intentions exprimées au cours des dernières semaines puissent devenir une réalité. Nous avons vu d'excellents exemples de solidarité entre les entreprises avec des licences ouvertes, un appui du transfert technologie via le partenariat d'accès technologie afin de faire en sorte que les pénuries puissent être surmontées. L'OMS reconnaît les efforts qui ont été entrepris ainsi que les initiatives afin de garantir l'accès à tous. Tels seront les thèmes importants abordés la semaine prochaine à l'Assemblée mondiale de la santé. Au début de la pandémie, le président Alvarado m'a demandé de mettre au point un dépôt de technologies médicales pour les vaccins, les médicaments, les diagnostics et tout autre outil utile dans la lutte contre la COVID-19. L'OMS a accepté cette proposition visionnaire qui nous a été proposée par le président Alvarado. Et au cours des semaines à venir, nous allons mettre en place une plateforme en vue d'un partage de savoir, de données, de propriétés intellectuelles qui soient ouvertes et collaboratives au sujet des outils de santé nécessaires, nouveaux ou à venir, pour lutter contre la COVID-19. J'ai donc le plaisir de donner la parole à notre invité spécial, le président Alvarado du Costa Rica, qui va nous en dire un peu plus au sujet de cette proposition. Mon frère, vous avez la parole. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tedros, uh, mi hermano, my brother. Thank you very Bonjour, Dr. Tedros, I like mon to frère, thank, uh, merci President beaucoup. Pinera. Je remercie le président Pinera du Chili qui s'est joint à nous, ainsi que le président Moreno de l'Équateur, qui a été le premier à soutenir cette initiative que nous avons lancée il y a un mois. 
En quoi consiste uh, cette initiative Permettez-moi um, de m'apesantir sur cette question. Create, we propose to create Nous proposons a pool, de a créer une of intellectual de propriété. Uh, and this is with uh, data, pour la with knowledge, technologies, designs uh, regarding COVID-19. In this repository, uh, repository the idea is to make available for avec, uh, everybody around the world the different advancements so or innovations uh, to put those into service at the lowest cost uh, without any uh, barriers to protect people. That's the idea behind Behind this. We are also calling for this to be a, a, a repository created on a voluntary basis because now we need solidarity and that's uh, what it's, it's, it's all about. Two months ago when we launched this initiative there were many things uh, we were not acquainted, uh, we, we didn't knew about uh, Uh, about COVID-19. And throughout those two months, months there's, there's so much knowledge and science mois, created that it's good, good to benefit of, uh, of people around the world. Uh, for one case, uh, yesterday I was in one university in Costa Rica in which they took some open, open source designs for uh, medical devices and actually des, they improved uh, those To, with the knowledge locally developed on the treatment on COVID-19, they improved those. And now that university is putting the improved designs also available um, around the world. Those are the kind of things that we can do now based on, uh, on solidarity and understanding that this pandemic Uh, attacks the same uh, a rich country than a poor country than a mid-income country uh, regardless or even in citizens uh, regardless whether you have the resources or not uh, it attacks people all around the world in, in the same way so the basic idea is a call for solidarity and a call to action for creating this repository, a global pool for rights on data, knowledge, technologies to make more affordable and accessible the new techniques, new technologies, new vaccines, new treatments so we can, as one around the world, defeat COVID-19. And the call is for member states la COVID-19. Private sector and companies, for research institutions and for cooperation agencies all around the world on a voluntary basis. We want to see this, the, those innovations and technologies as global public goods. Global public goods to protect humanity against this threat. So it's a call for solidarity. As you mentioned, Dr. Tedros, this is going to be a part of the discussion in the, in the WHO conference next week. And we will be launching this call to action uh, on May 29th of this month. May 29th, we'll be uh, looking for the offic official launch. We're still open uh, in this initiative to receive the support of more countries, and that's why we're so thankful for the leadership of uh, President Piñera uh, supporting this uh, joint effort, which I appreciate a lot. And going back to this is only together, only with multilateralism, Only with though that kind of leadership, um, we can defeat coronavirus. Not closing um, in, in nationalisms, not, um, not being selfish. It's the time for the contrary. It's the time for solidarity. It's the time to, to work together. Actually, it's an opportunity for humanity to show the best of what we are made of. And I think it's a great opportunity for humanity to to show our brotherhood as, as a whole. And um, that's what it's all about, this call to, to action that we, with also the leadership of Dr. Tedros, um, we are 
presenting today. And to you, Dr. Tidros, also to President Piñera and other partners, thank you for your leadership, particularly Dr. Tidros, uh, my brother, mi hermano, we have to keep on with this uh, joint work together and thank you very much for all what you've been doing and thank you for supporting as well this initiative from Costa Rica. Muchas, muchas gracias, uh, hermano. Thank you, thank you so much, President Alvarado, uh, for that very, very inspiring speech. Uh, I have seen your commitment when we met in Geneva and also the follow-up discussions we had, especially based on this initiative that you have just uh, proposed. So all my respect and appreciation for your commitment and leadership. And I would like to quote you. Using this initiative, you said, let's show the best of humanity. And I fully agree. And I join you in adding uh, my voice to that call and look forward to May 19 when we launch it officially. And many countries are already showing their commitment and I know May 19 will be a successful launching event. Muchas gracias for your leadership. And now I would like to request President Sebastian Piñera of Chile uh, to take the floor and to uh, give us his um, views on this uh, initiative. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Buenos días, director general. Voy a dirigir unas palabras a nombre de mi presidente, quien estuvo a la hora de conexión, pero lamentablemente tuvo que dejar esta sala para atender otras iniciativas de su agenda. Primero que nada, agradecer muy sinceramente a la presidencia de Costa Rica por el privilegio que nos ha dado de unirnos a esta iniciativa repositorio mundial de libre acceso para tecnología de salud, para la detección, prevención y control y tratamiento del COVID. Ahora, reconocemos el papel rector de la OMS como principal organismo especializado en el sector de la salud, así como las funciones que le competen en cuanto a la política sanitaria de conformidad con su mandato. Observamos con preocupación el ciclo vicioso de la pandemia y sus factores de riesgo ya que aumentan la pobreza, mientras que la pobreza contribuye a aumentar las tasas de las enfermedades transmisibles, lo cual amenaza la salud pública y el desarrollo económico-social. De ahí que damos la más cordial bienvenida a la iniciativa de Costa Rica. Como sabemos, la pandemia afecta a las personas de todas las edades, sexo, raza e ingreso, a los pobres, a los que viven en situación de vulnerabilidad, en particular en los países en desarrollo, ya que soportan una carga desproporcionada. Existe un claro reconocimiento a toda la comunidad internacional de que ningún país por sí solo puede salir adelante, solo unidos podemos enfrentar la pandemia en forma exitosa. Es un honor, reitero, para Chile participar de esta iniciativa a la cual le atribuimos la mayor importancia. Muchas gracias, director general. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency, for your statement. And Your Excellencies, thank you for laying down a collective vision for how the world can deliver life-saving health technologies to tackle COVID-19. Global solidarity will accelerate science and expand access so that together we can overcome the virus. Until everyone is protected, the world remains at risk. I know you have busy schedules, Your Excellencies, so I will just say thank you to all once again, President Alvarado and President Piñera. Thank you so much. And now I will make the rest of my uh, remarks. Next week, one of the most important World Health Assemblies will take place since we were founded 
in 1948. I'm looking forward to greeting and working with leaders from across the world to ensure that together we optimize the COVID-19 response and build back stronger health systems. Over the past few months across the world, we have shown that when countries implement a comprehensive strategy, they can effectively contain and suppress the spread of the virus while minimizing the impact on lives and livelihoods. The pandemic has shown again and in the strongest way possible that investing in health is not just the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. There is no trade-off between investing in health and your economy. Health is an investment in our collective future. Funding quality health for all doesn't just save lives. It means children are healthy and can go to school, people can go to work to earn a living, and societies and economies are both stronger and more sustainable. Yesterday, WHO released a policy brief on gender and COVID-19, which encourages countries to incorporate a gender focus into their responses. It includes six key asks for governments. First, when recording cases, collect both age and sex disaggregated data. Second, prevent and respond effectively to issues of domestic violence, which have been exacerbated by the pandemic. Third, encourage availability and access to sexual and reproductive health services. Fourth, protect and support all health workers, approximately 70% of whom are women. Fifth, ensure equitable access to testing and treatment for COVID-19. And finally, sixth, ensure responses are both inclusive and non-discriminatory. To maximize effectiveness and ensure that no one is left behind, tackling the pandemic requires a gender-responsive, equity-oriented, and human rights-based approach. This evening, WHO will release a scientific brief on multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. In the past weeks, reports from Europe and North America have described a small number of children being admitted to intensive care units with a multi-system inflammatory condition with some features similar to Kawasaki's disease and toxic shock syndrome. Initial reports hypothesize that this syndrome may be related to COVID-19. It's critical to urgently and carefully characterize this clinical syndrome to understand causality and to describe treatment interventions. Together with our global clinical network for COVID-19, WHO has developed a preliminary case definition and a case report form for multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. I call on all clinicians worldwide to work with your national authorities and WHO to be on the alert and better understand this syndrome in children. I will repeat this. I call on all clinicians worldwide to work with your national authorities and WHO to be on the alert and better understand this syndrome in children. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tedros. Also, thanks to our special guests who were with us today. Uh, we will open the floor to questions. Just before that, to remind you that we have a, uh, to uh, 
guests that are not usually with us here. That's uh, Dr. Mariangela Simao, uh, who is Assistant Director General for Access to Medicines and Health Products, and Mr. Derek uh, Walton, who is a legal uh, counsel. We will uh, try to uh, have as many questions as possible, and that's why I will ask you to be uh, very concise and one question per person. So if, uh, if we are... Uh, Okay, so uh, we are just trying to put the system up to make sure that uh, we get everyone uh, online. Okay, first question comes to uh, Jim from uh, Westwood One. Jim, please, uh, if you hear us, uh, unmute yourself and you have a floor. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, I guess, where you are. Thank you, Tarek. Uh, thank you, Chris. Thank you, everyone. My question happens to be about this Kawasaki syndrome related uh, thing with COVID-19. Uh, it, it can't be a coincidence, obviously. There's some sort of connection. What do we know so far about this connection between this inflammatory syndrome and COVID-19 in children? So thank you for this question. I can start and, and uh, perhaps others would like to supplement. So this um, syndrome, it's, we're, we're calling it multi-system inflammatory syndrome, um, is a, a condition that has, was alerted to us from our colleagues in the United Kingdom a few weeks ago, two weeks ago. Um, and it's a very rare condition um, which is causing an inflammatory disease uh, in, in young children. Um, what we've done with that information is that we've discussed this with our global clinical network, which is a group of clinicians um, across the world who are dealing with patients for COVID-19, and specifically talking with our pediatricians who are part of that uh, global network. Um, and in doing so, asking who has seen this in their countries, where they have seen it, uh, how often they have seen it, what this syndrome actually looks like. Um, and in doing so, uh, raise the alert among this global network. Um, we've heard of additional reports uh, in, a, in a few countries, including the United States, including Italy. Um, and so we're learning uh, that it seems to be a very rare syndrome, but we need more information. And we need more information collected in a systematic way because uh, with the initial reports, uh, we're getting a description of what this looks like, which is not always the same. And in some children, they've tested positive for COVID-19, but other children have not. So we don't know if this is associated with COVID-19 or not. So what we've done is through our clinical network uh, and together with our, our partners is put together a case report form. So this is, this is a data collection tool uh, in which clinicians can use to collect standardized information so that we could better understand what this disease looks like, um, how we could better uh, develop treatments uh, for this. Um, and that's important. So, so far we understand that it's rare, um, but we are hearing more and more reports about it um, because people are on the lookout. So as the Director General has said, um, and as we've said, that we need clinicians to be on alert for this, to look for it, but also to ensure that we collect standardized information so that we can better describe what this is um, and so that we can, we can develop better treatment. Thank you very much, uh, um, Dr. Van Kerkhoff, for this answer. And as Dr. Tadros said, we will have a scientific brief on this. Uh, let's uh, go to Michael uh, Bosjurki from uh, CNN. Michael, can you hear us? I can hear you loud and clear. Thank you for taking my question. Um, I'm Michael Bosjurki, a contributor to CNN Opinion. And just quickly, I think I speak on behalf of all of us when we uh, express our gratitude for your forthrightness with these uh, press conferences. They're very helpful. Um, may I put this question to you? Uh, at the 70th uh, WHA, the Russian Federation presided over the forum for the first time, as you know. And at the time, the Minister of Health said it was, quote, an acknowledgement of Russia's achievement in developing its health system, unquote. And yet the Russian Federation is now registering the second highest caseload of COVID-19, 262,000 cases plus as of today, 10 to 13,000 on average being added every day. And uh, death rates are suspiciously low. Sorry, it, uh, I think it's over 2,000. Um, just quickly, uh, the question will be coming. <laughs> the head of the doctors' union in Russia told me among the sick and dead are many, many doctors, 
and frontline healthcare workers who are being forced to work without PPE. They're stressed and being forced to go to work. Some reports of doctors mysteriously falling out of windows. And just quickly, a former U.S. ambassador to Russia, I interviewed, told me over the past 10 years has been a wanton destruction of the healthcare system with hundreds of hospitals closed. What is your assessment of what is going on in Russia? Since day one, you've ad advocated very forcefully and passionately for healthcare workers, and surely this is a situation where WHO can find a voice. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. And if it's really possible to have a shorter questions for others, thank you. <clears throat> well, maybe longer questions, get shorter answers, maybe work the way to go. <clears throat> Uh, thanks for the question. I, I think, like all systems around the world, or many systems around the world, uh, uh, <clears throat> when you see that uh, rapid rise in cases, uh, systems can struggle to cope with that caseload and with uh, adapting to that and adjusting and being able to deal with it, uh, to deal with it uh, effectively. Um, certainly from the perspective of the Russian Federation, they've been very good at ramping up testing and making testing more available. But it is clear in certain areas that the number of cases is stressing the healthcare system. Um, and there have been a relatively no number of uh, reported deaths. And we're looking at that with our colleagues in, in the Federation <coughs> uh, from the perspective of the way deaths are recorded. And I think this is another issue we're seeing around the world. People are struggling with how to record the deaths. Uh, are deaths recorded as confirmed cases who die, or is the death recording related? to a post-mortem diagnosis where a physician declares or certifies the death. And there's some confusion at times as to whether if someone dies of a heart attack and they had COVID, did they die from COVID uh, with a heart attack or did they die from a heart attack while having COVID? And if, if that's not done clearly, then you can miss COVID-19 related deaths. Uh, WHO has issued very specific guidance uh, around the classification of mortality related to COVID and I point you to our guidance on that on our website. Uh, I did speak with, uh, with uh, colleagues, uh, <coughs> Dr. Smolensky and others at the Rotten, 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 Azor, uh, earlier today because we are interested in understanding more of the surveillance and how it's been done in Russia and particularly how mortality has been recorded. I'm not aware of the, the issues you raised regarding PPE. We'll certainly look into that. It is not appropriate for frontline staff to be operating without <coughs> uh, adequate personal protective equipment and adequate training. But again, we have seen that happen all over the world, tragically, uh, and we will do all possible to support our colleagues in Russia to ensure that that uh, situation, if it exists, does not persist. Next question uh, is coming from uh, our Geneva-based uh, colleague Bayram, who works for Anatoly News Agency from Turkey. Bayram, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you very much. I have a short question for Mr. Uh, Dr. Tedros. That, uh, Mr. Tedros, uh, do you think uh, the initi initiative uh, today on open access to vaccines and drugs against COVID-19 can get the support of President Trump? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I cannot answer that question. I think you better ask um, uh, the president. Um, that was a short question, short answer. Now uh, we go to uh, Bianca Rotier from uh, Global from Brazil. Bianca. Hi, Tarek. Thanks a lot. Can you hear me? Yes. Thanks. Um, uh, yeah, I work for Brazilian TV, Global and Global News, so I'll make the question in Portuguese. Eu, eu acho que os senhores devem lembrar, o Mike Ryan comentou aqui a vez sobre a troca de ministros do, da saúde no Brasil e depois de um mês só no cargo, o novo ministro já pediu demissão. E ele tinha posições diferentes do presidente Jair Bolsonaro em assuntos como o uso da cloroquina, o chamado isolamento vertical, com apenas alguns isolamento e inclusão de salões de beleza e academias de ginástica entre os serviços considerados essenciais. Eu não espero por parte do OMS uma resposta sobre política, naturalmente, mas eu gostaria de saber qual a orientação 
em relação a esses temas que têm gerado tanta dúvida e têm deixado os brasileiros completamente perdidos. Então, cloroquina, isolamento vertical, salões e academias de ginástica como serviços essenciais. Muito obrigada. I don't think the, the question <clears throat> is clear. Um, from the perspective in Brazil, we've seen the increase in the number of cases, and, and in, in general, we've seen an increase in the number of Central and, and, and South American countries. Uh, and I think this has been a factor in <clears throat> many large federated states. Uh, the Director General has, I think, said this many, many times. Uh, regardless of the effectiveness of the health system, what's really crucial is that there's coherence cohesion uh, and across party, all of government, all of society approach, uh, especially in large federated states where that's communities need to hear a consistent message from leadership at all levels. Uh, that message needs to be clear and, uh, and governments need to walk the talk uh, of those messages. So I think all countries have struggled and this is not a phenomenon uh, unique to Brazil. It is difficult in the face of a major crisis to maintain that cohesion, to maintain trust with society, to ensure that governance is driven and by science. Um, and these are the factors, uh, the behaviors, <clears throat> and the ethos that drives a perfect, re uh, not a perfect response, but a, a good response. No response is perfect. It's very difficult to look at any response around the world and say that anyone has got it completely right. But those <clears throat> who've got it better have been those countries that have really worked on a cohesive, clear uh, communication with population, simple messages, and uh, an all-party and all-of-society approach. Uh, thank you very much. We have a couple of reporters we did not have in the past. So we have uh, Vince Chadwick from DevEx. Vince, uh, are you online? Vince Chadwick? Yes, hi. Um, I, my question is about the initiative um, uh, from Costa Rica and Chile and how, if at all, that will be addressed at um, the World Health Assembly next week, please. Uh, well, there is a, you all know there is a resolution being negotiated for the World Health Assembly which contains several uh, access uh, related issues, access to health products. So we expect that the, some, some of the issues that are being part of the call to action, uh, Costa Rica call to action, are addressed in the draft resolution as it is like, for example, the, the ensuring equitable access, uh, supporting of COVID-related knowledge, lessons learned, experience, best practice. These are part of the resolution as it is at the moment. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Simao, for this answer. Now we go to Lisa Schneering from Sidrap News. Lisa? Thanks for taking my question. I am just wondering what the situation is in the Middle East. It seems like cases are steadily going up there and, um, you know, we track that every day and seems um, just wondering how you would characterize that. I understand every country has a different situation, but it would be good to get your comments on that. Thanks so much. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I can begin on that. The, the DG may wish to add. Um, there are a number of uh, different dynamics in the, in, in, in the Middle East, and, and the numbers have been relatively stable in the Middle East, but there have been in some increases in the Gulf countries. Uh, but uh, worryingly, we've seen, uh, for example, uh, increases in cases in places like Yemen. We've seen the introduction of disease into camp and displaced populations uh, in uh, in places uh, like Iraq, we've had at least one case in a refugee camp. So, uh, and and also we've had cases in, in Syria. The the difficulty uh, in in many of the Middle Eastern countries, uh, and there's a huge contrast in the Middle East between countries that are relatively wealthy and well provisioned in terms of healthcare, and then countries in which we have huge conflict, fragility, and vulnerability. And uh, the, the situation, the risks, and the potential impact of this disease is very different in all. 
it is exceptionally difficult to run uh, essential health services in many countries, particularly in the likes of uh, Yemen, Syria, and, and Iraq. Um, and uh, the UN is working with governments and partners for years now to try and s to sustain those essential services. It is all the more difficult then to respond effectively uh, to the arrival of the disease uh, in, in many of these uh, situations. Many of the countries are fractured with different zones of control and different health authorities, so often in conflict. Uh, and WHO and its partners have to walk, work across lines, across front lines, work cross border. And it's, 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 it's a very, very dynamic situation. It's a very sensitive situation and one in which uh, we have to uh, try our best to serve those uh, who are, are most vulnerable. Uh, if we take the case of, of Yemen, uh, there's a, a very worrying situation emerging in terms of the number of cases uh, in both the north and the south. Uh, and WHO has been working um, <clears throat> very, very hard in Yemen, despite these difficulties with our UN partners, where we've repurposed 26 EOCs uh, across the country, 10 operational in the south, 13 in the north. We've established with the government four COVID hotlines. <clears throat> we've repurposed. 300 rapid response teams which were trained uh, for, for cholera. We need about a thousand of those teams with two to five staff per team. These are the contact tracing teams, the teams that go out and look for cases and do that public health work we're always uh, talking about. Most of these teams are mobile. These are 202 district mobile teams in the north, 131 uh, in the south. Um, we've already begun rapid response trainings and clinical management training with a large number of clinicians, nurses, and doctors, uh, and established uh, screening at points of uh, screening at points of entry, uh, we've supported the repurposing of four functional central public health labs in Aden, Sana, Sayum, and Taiz. Uh, we've trained 28 lab technicians in the diagnosis using these rapid and PCR-based tests. Uh, we've deployed over 7,000 tests. Uh, 3,500 in the north, uh, 3,200 in the south, and we have another 30,000 on the way. Uh, we re created 19 isolation units, 16 are in progress, three are completed, and we've trained 92 frontline uh, workers to staff uh, those units so far. Um, and uh, uh, that list goes on. In terms of operational support, uh, we've provided 1,000 ICU beds, 417 ventilators, and then, as I said, another uh, uh, 50,000 tests are, are in the pipeline. Uh, we're refilling nearly 12,000 cylinders of oxygen per month, uh, distributing defibrillators, ECG machines, IV pumps, pulse oximeters, and many other things. Now, that sounds like a very long list, and it is a long list. But I can assure you, moving that type of material in this situation, training health workers in this situation, doing surveillance in this situation, contact tracing in this situation, is difficult, uh, stressful, and, and dangerous work. And the DG has called for it. The Secretary General has called for it. We need health for peace. We need peace for health. It is going to be very difficult to contain this virus in settings like this, uh, having to operate in conditions like this, unless we get a more peaceful environment to do this. <clears throat> Again, Tedros has said, no one is safe until everyone is safe. We need to make the people of the Middle East, particularly those in fragile and co conflict-affected uh, situations, uh, safer, because that will make uh, everybody safer. We're also working across a number of Gulf countries on issues related to migrant workers, and Maria may wish to comment on that. We are concerned about migrant workers who live mainly in dormitory-like situations. We've seen the impacts of that in places like Singapore. We thank Singapore, the Gulf countries, and South Africa for working with us on this issue. Maria has just uh, finished some uh, in discussions with uh, those partner countries today. She may wish to update you. This is the primary audio circuit for the Reuters live service. This is the primary audio circuit for the Reuters live service.
is the primary audio circuit for the Reuters Live 